Yeah, thank you. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen if that's okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Evie Murray and I am the uh, founder and chief executive of what used to be called uh, Leith Community Crops and Pots and is now called Earth and Common. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully I get this right. And play from the start. Yeah, so uh, it's good to see everybody here and thanks for coming along to here. It's really an honour to kind of share our story with people and um, just explain what we're doing because a lot of times people will see what's going on on the craft and in and leaf and, and not really sort of know what it's about. So it's a real honour to be able to kind of share that. Um, so we're going to be talking about urban crafts and cultivating how we live and learn. And before we go into sort of how the craft came into being, I thought it was very good to, to sort of share a little bit about, um, about what an urban craft is um, and, and what it means to us a little bit. Um, so what role can uh, urban crafts play in the food and climate movement is a question that we have. Uh, and a question that we've been kind of working on on the last kind of eight years of our kind of growth and uh, development. Um, so what we say is that urban cross on common good land bring people together from very different backgrounds, uh, intergenerational, from babies right through to um, the older generation and our elders who are uh, very much a part of the croft and so much more diversity in between that. Um, connected to the land and to each other, we do believe that people, people become quite politicised actors in the food and climate movement, which is something that we champion all the way. Um, and we are... Uh, kind of proven the case at the moment that a network of urban crafts could contribute and certainly not on their own uh, but could certainly contribute to uh, surplant an agro industry and provide cross-cutting solutions uh, to society and environmental issues. So first of all before I go into our croft and Leith I just wanted to talk a little bit about what crofting is because not everybody knows um, I was actually presenting a similar talk up in Noidart and uh, I was explaining to them what a croft was and I think that you'd find that people um, up in Noidart would know um, about more about crofting than perhaps myself being a city girl coming from Leith and growing up there all my life. Um, but I do think it's, it's worth sort of just explaining what a croft is first of all. Um, so it's a small holding, traditionally sort of family owned a piece of land. Um, it's traditionally distinguished through values of cooperative endeavor, self-sufficiency and intergenerational care and skill sharing. Although I have to say that crofting in the Highlands can sometimes uh, not take on these romantic kind of notions. Uh, sometimes you'll find crofting quite sort of, um, you know, um, need, in need of revival, I think even in the, even in the Highlands. Um, so we really love this word ducus um, and we use it quite a lot um, down, down on the croft and have done since the croft's kind of conception way back eight years ago. And ducus is this feeling of belonging to a place and taking responsibility for it, um, which is something that we feel is really sort of central to our ethos. So we've established what, what we call Scotland's first modern urban croft, which is in Leith. And it's um, it's on two acres of common good land, um, and it's uh, a shared endeavour where we are growing food on it communally as part of a community. And I, I think it's important just to have some background into the sort of into the history. And so, if you look at the tragedy of the Commons, which is a really interesting kind of thing, where Hardin's theory was that when people have access to um, to common resources um, that they uh, they are not able to sort of manage them and uh, would destroy the sort of common resource. Um, but that was widely sort of debunked by Ostrom in 1990. Um, it was a thought experiment not based on how communities actually cooperate uh, and manage community resources. And I think that's really sort of important because um, I, I think that what we're doing on the Croft is really kind of proving the case that communities can come together and create quite powerful management of common land and common resources. So it kind of links into our story quite a bit. Um, 
so we do believe that communities uh, can and do manage uh, commons uh, sustainably and there's loads of examples not just here in Scotland but in societies in Amazonia, uh, Australia and Zimbabwe to name but a few but there's definitely more and so just to say a little bit about our little urban croft in, in Leith which really started off as a really sort of on the economic unrest of the 2008 financial crisis. Um, so this was at a time where I had been working as a drug addiction counsellor in Leith um, for about eight years. Um, and the, the financial crisis happened just at a time when I was being made redundant from my job because um, a lot of funding got pulled from third sector organisations. And so I was working with Turning Point for about eight years, which was really sort of poignant to be working in heroin addiction because coming from Leith, um, and I certainly did grow up here and was very much sort of aware of the sort of uh, drug related issues that you might have heard about in train spotting or read about in train spotting. And so I was just being made redundant from my job where I had been working for the last eight years um, on trying to get vulnerable adults um, off heroin and into rehabilitation. And I had done that job for about eight years and found that actually by the time quite a lot of damage has happened to vulnerable adults in their life, whether it be through care, through poverty, through you know abuse, domestic violence, whatever that kind of issue might be, that it's very difficult to kind of try to retrain an adult into a healthier lifestyle. Uh, and I came out of uh, working, um, working in that line of work sort of a little bit um, feeling because I trained as a therapist and I felt that actually talking the talking therapeutic cure is often not very successful at bringing people back into a healthy life so firstly for me I felt that well I should say that actually um two children had been abandoned into my care. And I also had my own children that I was looking after at the time that I'd just been made redundant. And so these children had come from quite a difficult background and had multiple levels of trauma in their lives. And I, they literally kind of just got, um, I won't go into the sort of background of that too much, but um, they got left on my doorstep. And all of a sudden I had six children of which I was like the little woman that lived in a shoe. and. Uh, because my baby was only two months old at the time, uh, I was like, I really need to find stuff for these kids to do. And so that's when I started growing crops and pots in my backyard. And it was really sort of, you know, after working in heroin addiction for eight years and then suddenly having these two traumatized little children that needed a lot of care and a lot of attention and a lot of um, trauma support uh, and what have you, that my, my response to that and not just that but the, so you had the financial crisis but you also had the environmental crisis with the bees the decline in the bees so I don't know if you can cast your mind back to that period in time but the bee crisis had just really hit the headlines and there was a Tiscopoly working in the area and there was a lot of sort of around the Occupy movement just about conglomerates extracting wealth out of communities and so with all the things that had sort of got me to that point, I just felt that, you know, I had to do something, not just with these little children that needed my support, but something wider that actually, you know, about the inequality and the and the nature of Leith as a place and just how it was failing people and letting people fall through the cracks. So that's when I started in 2013 to grow crops and pots because I felt that way back then that the the supermarkets were really extracting wealth. They were also polluting the environment with uh, plastic waste. Because I had so many children at the time, my recycling had just gone through the roof because my family had expanded overnight. So I was trying to work out how I could deal with all this waste coming out of, you know, and how I could recycle it. And my, my, my own waste as a family household had expanded greatly and you know and so I was really sort of interested in tackling all these issues but really tackling um the issue that adults tend not to get better so really like what can we do for children so that they don't grow up so that they're not a community that have kind of fallen 
fallen fallen behind and fallen through the cracks and been neglected and and uh, ignored and so really it was an amalgamation of all these different things the environmental crisis the climate crisis the inequality um and and my solution to that was to take control of the food system <laughs> and and have the food system to be back in the power of people and to be from the very early on was to be sort of creating community wealth you know community empowerment all these things and um, how can we take charge of our climate crisis how can we take charge of the biodiversity loss and all these things just sort of percolated and so i'd taken my backyard which is at the back of dr bell's um, family center it was very concrete sort of barren gray space and i started growing all these plant uh, plants and it wasn't long before you know you started growing the foods that the aphids came to munch on the plants and then the ladybirds came and then the butterflies arrived and before you knew it it was this little oasis in the middle of the city where actually the children could get um therapeutic sort of care sort of at, um connection to nature education and there was quite a lot of sort of mums who were connected to my children at nursery and what have you, who seen me walking about with my wheelbarrow and growing food in different places around Leith. And sort of, it suddenly became a sort of mother and toddler group where it was like, yeah, let's get our kids outdoor. Let's teach them where their food comes from. And so quite quickly, we had a little sort of mother and toddler group. So I had all these children, we were growing food and what have you. Um, it was around about 24, 13, 2014, where we took on the derelict bit of land in Leith Links Park, um, which was um, basically a hidden part of Leith Links that nobody really wanted to go into because it was um, misused <clears throat> over the years. It had, um, you know, um, drug paraphernalia, um, paraphernalia related to um, prostitution, and uh, a lot of dog walkers also used the place and didn't um, pick up the mess. So when we went in to sort of think about, imagine what we could do with this part of the park, um, we really did get very mucky cleaning that place up. And so the first thing that I did was have an imagine what we could do with this space kind of day. And we went and we picked up all the all the manky stuff. And I think we actually recycled most of it as well. So it was really sort of that environmental sort of thing was really at the heart of what we were doing. And so that's kind of how it began. So it began with no money, <laughs> no master plan, certainly not from a top down sort of um, like, you know, or, or an understanding of how charities work and how funding works. And so it was a real sort of learning journey as, as, as we've gone on. So the first thing we've done was constituted the charity and wrote out our charitable purposes. We quite quickly managed to secure some funding from the Climate Challenge Fund and that catapulted us into quite a sort of different sphere because that was quite a big fund um, and all of a sudden I became an employer and we were employing staff to run projects in schools. Um, but with the short term nature of funding, the charity has sort of gone up and down and up and down and, and you know, and so sometimes um, it can it can seem like the charity has got quite a lot of money, but actually it's it's um, a bit of money for a short period of time. And then actually then, you know, your core funding and all the things that you need to run it are actually not in place. So there, it's been a bit of a sort of roller coaster journey and it certainly didn't just come to be how it is today um, without massive amounts of upheaval and, and interesting things that have gone on. But today on the Croft, um, we have 120 crofters who all grow their own food uh, communally on shared um, uh, shared plots. Um, we tend to sort of um, encourage it not to be called an allotment. I mean, it's quite distinct from allotments in that the space is open. Um, allotments tend to be sort of shut. Uh, but also we, the, how we allocate the land, we do it on a yearly basis rather than a sort of this is permanently your space because a lot of time you get plot neglect or people don't manage to pick up what they think they might be able to do or want to do because they've had a baby or they've maybe moved away. So there's a lot of reasons why things change. So we refresh and revive that every year. And then over the last couple of years, we've been really cultivating our market garden. So we've been growing food um, for sale. And I think during the pandemic, the market garden really came into fruition, uh, mainly because there's a lot of people on furlough. 
and um, they wanted to volunteer and be part of something. So we, we had about 100, 150 volunteers during the pandemic who really came down and worked in short periods of time at a distance. So it was safe um, for the pandemic. Um, for COVID um, reasons uh, and worked in different sections of the market garden. We had a turnover of like um, three or four different groups of volunteers that would come in over a period just to keep it safe. And so our market garden had just really flourished over the last couple of years. And we are growing veg that we sell every day down, on the, um, down at the cafe and then at the farmer's market. Uh, so the farmer's market, again, is something that we relaunched again just after the pandemic when we were coming out of uh, the restrictions. Um, and that was really, really thriving. Um, and it's also allowing uh, an outlet for many traders to come and, and start up their business or, or support their business during the pandemic. So that's been really good to do. Um, and then we started a couple of years ago, the Croft Carbon College which is basically environmental education. And I was always kind of really inspired by Schumacher College and Satish Kumar, from, um, who uh, was the editor-in-chief of Resurgence magazine. So these are people that have been inspiring me the whole time. And so I was thinking, well, Scotland should have a, a Schumacher College. And so the Croft Carbon College is the manifestation of this notion that Scotland should have a, you know, a college. Um, that is very similar to the ethos of the Schumacher College, but very different in, in that it's in an urban setting and it, we're, we're doing that in a very different way. And then a couple of years ago, we also started Minecraft. Um, Minecraft is uh, obviously the take on uh, video games, uh, the very popular video game called Minecraft. Um, and but, but it's really about getting kids off their computer and getting them outside and getting them connected to nature and taking part in learning skills. And so the Croft Carbon College and Minecraft kind of really go hand in hand. And then we've been over the years, we've been really involved in campaigning for national um, and really international campaigning around food and the environment. Um, and so we've been, um, I'm going to say a little bit more about that. So how our local initiatives really connect us to national and international issues. So um, our journey has been, we, we always had a mantra that fun is, you know, it's not sustainable if it's not fun. So, um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but I suppose the bigger picture is the food sovereignty and climate justice movement. So the food movement uh, really originated as a response to productivist green revolution, sort of uh, based on the, the monocultures and the pesticides and the fossil fuels that you use to grow our food. And I mean, that was way back, you know, a long time ago. And now seeing where we are in the middle of the pandemic right now and seeing the shelves in the supermarket running empty for these very reasons, the pandemic and Brexit and all these things. And so the modern uh, food movement in the global north initially focused on um, um, born illnesses, health and obesity. So really sort of looking at the sort of health and obesity and, you know, things that were um, prevalent in our society. Um, and the important components that are still very much alive and, and kicking today, uh, the peasant movement for self-determination and food sovereignty uh, through organisations like La Via Campesina. And if you don't know of La Via Campesina, I definitely advise for you to check them out. And then there's obviously, there's also the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. So what we're doing here in Scotland is part of a much bigger thing around, uh, around the world about food sovereignty and climate change you know it's part of a global movement so we don't we see ourselves as having allies all over the world that are working towards the kind of changes that we are trying to materialize here in Leith and someone once said to me oh well you can't change change anything with two acres of land and in 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 Leith Links Park and I was like well Actually, you're probably right that we can't feed all of Leith from two acres of land in, in Leith Links Park, but what we can do is build a movement and a sort of campaign and a, a movement towards kind of doing these things. And then that's where we started off right from the very beginning is this notion that things are not okay in society, things are not okay environmentally, and we need to do something about it. And so lo and behold, uh, many years later, um, we've been pushing for change, uh, working very closely with Pete Ritchie, who's in the picture there, uh, who you might know from Nourish Scotland, 
uh, and uh, that's myself standing next to him and many other people from Nourish uh, and different organisations. And so we, as a body from the Scottish Food Coalition, have been pushing for the Good Food Nation Bill, which hurry, is actually um, going to be introduced in this term of government. Actually, it's going to be the first bill that gets introduced in this term of government. Um, and what we're really pushing for is that bill to be as radical uh, as it possibly can be. So we want an independent statutory body, cross-cut national food plans, duties on uh, public bodies, looking at procurement, and then the right to food in Scots law. And I think there's actually a fifth one that's fallen off the, fallen off the radar there, but I, I, I will find what that one is and I send it to you if you're interested, but you can also check up on the Scottish Food Coalition website for more information there. And so as I was saying about the sort of fun aspect, with, you know, whilst we're tackling these really big serious issues, um, the, the journey of um, starting with my little two acres in Leithlings Park that everybody says, well, you can't make change from, from that, has kind of taken us, you know, we've attended the La Via Campesina International Food Sovereignty Conference in Romania. And there, you might, some of you might recognize some of the people in the pictures there, but that Ruben um, Chester's there. He uh, is running Locavore. Locavore is a very successful community um, uh, farm shop kind of movement that's been happening ever since the very sort of beginning of the craft. We were very connected with Ruben and many other environmental organizations across Scotland. Um, and Ruben's organization, if you don't know of them, I would definitely check them out because they're just opening a locavore up in Dalry in Edinburgh. So they've got um, shops in Glasgow, but they're moving to have many more shops across the central belt. Um, very much sort of colleagues of us from very early, early on. And there we are, just as, as young crofters, um, we uh, decided that it was really super important that we sent a delegation of our team to join the COP in Paris. Um, where obviously the, the sort of radical uh, Paris Climate Accord was, was agreed. Um, and so that was us as crops and pots heading off. That was the first day just before we left. And that was with some other environmental organizations. Um, and we went there as a collective group. Uh, really to attend the protest. So uh, we are very much activists. And uh, so that's us, that's me with a clown. I don't know where the clowning, clowning kind of came around from a sort of Occupy kind of uh, movement time where clowning just became sort of uh, a real sort of prevalent thing. And so that was me getting my picture taken with some clowns at the Red Lines uh, protest in, in Paris. Um, but we've also been pushing for change for climate justice globally. Um, so we um, were approached um, four years ago um, to partner up with a multi-partner project in Malawi, um, which really, after running that project for the last four years with uh, people that were more um, aware of international work uh, than, than we were. So we had uh, partners um, several partners that were a part of that but it really alerted us to the need uh, for the concept of restorative climate justice uh, which we've been campaigning on and actually um interest in organizations like the scotland malawi partnership and the international development alliance and people have been really picking up that work on restorative climate justice um, and so that has led us to be sort of members of these these organizations and in fact i'm going to the um scotland malawi partnership AGM uh, tomorrow, um, which will have the president of Malawi and our first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, I believe is going to be in attendance. And so, you know, it's just from a very sort of grassroots sort of place uh, to be sort of starting where we are and doing what we can. We seem to over the last sort of eight years be really building up to being quite a powerful voice in many different, different areas, which is really good. But a little bit more just about what we actually feel that we're tackling on Leith Community Croft. And I think this is kind of where it, it is becoming quite a powerful model um, for us. So we're looking at tackling social and environmental inequalities, uh, uniting people from different backgrounds across different activism causes, 
um, enacting our alternative structure that can strengthen the local economy, support biodiversity and agrobiodiversity, tackle isolation and poverty, um, promoting climate resilience and food security, reducing our emissions, uh, which are all in, uh, explicitly linked to international movements. And so when I've been sort of speaking about the Good Food Nation Bill, I really see that the Croft as a model is a powerful, uh, a powerful source to sort of help realise the Good Food Nation Bill because the one thing that the Good Food Nation Bill wants to do is it wants to cr cross government's uh, silos. It wants to you know, not, not see climate change as different from economic growth. It wants to and not see poverty and isolation as separate from you know, other issues. You know, uh, and that actually that somehow we sort of end this government siloed kind of thinking and bring it all together into one place. And I think that's probably what the Croft is actually best sort of if you try to describe it I think that's what we've managed to do is to sort of end the silo approach for tackling all these issues as a community in a small space and I think you know to my mind if that could be replicated across Scotland then that could be quite a powerful thing and so that's really what we're kind of pushing forward with at the moment um, so reclaiming land and reclaiming our power, and I suppose that's kind of where it started, was that, you know, people should not be left behind and the environment should be taken care of. So we've been, um, we look at skill sharing through the Croft Carbon College, uh, food growing, traditional crafts, you know, like willow weaving and, and fermentation. And so we do all these kind of workshops around our Croft Carbon College. Uh, experiential learning, building relationships with place and with, uh, you know, our local sort of pride or sense of a sense of pride or local identity. Um, and I've got a little video coming up to kind of show you and demonstrate that, which we absolutely love in the organisation and would be good to share. Um, we're building up knowledge of climate science, um, of, you know, the political sort of side of the, the food the food um, transformation, environmental movements, knowledge exchange, you know, there's a huge skill share, there's a seed, sh you know, we're sharing uh, crops, sharing seeds, sharing knowledge, um, and, you know, and it's, yeah, it really is about uh, collective empowerment and the experience of taking back control of something that has felt that has been taken out of our hands and trying to sort of regain some kind of, um, <laughs> um, agency over how our lives are 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 working for us, and I I think that is um, certainly the very notion when I started out was it was about trying to reclaim some agency in in how things are managed. Um, quite often, it can feel that things things are just happening and snowballing, and that we 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 don't have any ability to stop it and so the craft for me is very much about saying well this is how we stop this is how we this is how we do it um and so you know so joining these international struggles and having solidarity with people in malawi people in you know la via campesina all the peasant farmers across and you know we're really sort of uh, keen to be as what one of the crofters said to me the other day was that um we should really go to the most radical protest at COP26. What's the most radical one that we can go to? And that's the one we should be at. And uh, um, and so that's certainly what we'll what we'll be doing. But hold on, I'm going to show you this video because I think for me this video just sums up a lot of what the Croft just does naturally. Um, and this is actually part of our Minecraft program. But there's so many other children that just kind of come along and actually and actually have this learning experience and I'll, I'll show I'll show you the video and then I'll speak about it afterwards because you can see the video just like here are the ones that I like look I'll show you everyone I can eat these watch have you ever noticed you can eat these and when I just played Minecraft before watch this Eustace what's that Lydia could you get this that's my cousin I'm just going to play it again. I've just realised my laptop has is running out of battery and I need to get it plugged in before I cut out. I'll play it again so you can hear it. I'm going to turn my volume up. 
It's like here it's just, are a, the that, ones that I'll like. Look, I'll it's show you. Obviously, everyone, I can eat these. Is... Watch. If you ever notice, you can eat these. And we just to right. Minecraft before. Watch this. Watch this. That's my cousin. Bob. That's it on now. Yeah. I've saved my battery, <laughs> modern technology. But that is just, I don't know if you could you hear that okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so that is uh, two little kids that come along and they were so interested in video gaming and what have you. And they come along to Minecraft and there they are biting the heads off calendula flowers because they had learned that, you know, you can eat calendula. You might not want to eat a whole big head of it like that, but, you know, they were munching down. And it's certainly not the only kids that I've seen, like little tough kids, the boys that are running down and, and kind of picking these um borage or whatever and just knowing that that is okay to eat and, and what have you and just sitting stuff in their face with flowers is just you know it's kind of um it just reminds me of why the craft has such power um when we very when we first started out uh, a lot of kids in the local primary schools didn't know where their food come from they didn't know how it was growing and you'd ask them and they would say oh it comes from tesco because you know that's just what they had seen so to see that sort of learning just happen in a very natural way has just been so good and so what we are saying is that urban crafts on common good land do bring people together from different back backgrounds connected to land and other people people become active and food and climate movement um, and we think about um, the community backdrop in which inspires and sustains cross-cut and political action, which is what we're really sort of attempting to do. Um, and so we want to spread um, the urban crafts. And in fact, we just got funding from Esme Fairburn to replicate our urban craft model across Scotland. And um, I think that we are starting to be picked up as a, a real thing. Um, whereas before it was like, you know, maybe you can't make changes from two acres, you know, but I think we've been proven the point for the last eight years. And I think people are starting to catch on that actually, maybe we've, maybe we've got something here. Um, and so we're saying that, uh, especially if connected to rural crofting, that a network of urban crofts could supplant agro industry. I mean, you know, need to have ambition here so we're just you know going for it um and that it does contribute to cross-cutting solutions to society and environmental issues i'm being a bit repetitive here but what i would just say is that um with urban crafts across scotland that the future looks bright for children like this and children all over scotland and so that's really what we started out with was two very traumatized children who really needed some real uh, tender love and care and actually for all those sort are of vulnerable adults that do uh, and still do live in Leith that you know and and then the environmental catastrophe and that's really what we're working to challenge and to address and so we've been doing that hopefully with enough vigor for the last eight years and I'm looking forward to moving moving that on and going on to the next leg of our journey so um yeah, that's us. Thank you for attending and listening to me. It's a real pleasure to uh, meet you all and look forward to connecting with you.